Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. So, for example, I have a friend living in a long-term care home in Toronto, and I kept in touch with her every day. And, and she said the staff there were so terrified to be near anyone who tested positive for the virus that these people were left alone in bed to die from uh, dehydration, that that was common practice. And so while that was going on, the family members were not allowed in. So there's another, another uh, public uh, policy disaster. Uh, they, should, they were quite capable of putting on masks and gowns to go in and, and lend a hand, and they were not allowed in. And so the lessons learned from this, uh, this uh, fiasco uh, were that um, long-term care homes do not have pandemic plans, uh, as hospitals do, and they need them. And families should never be locked out under any circumstances. People don't go into long-term care to live out their decades of their lives. It's typically a few years when they're most vulnerable and need the most care because they can no longer care for themselves. Families of seniors long for a safe place for their aging loved ones to call home, not a factory-style turnout of assembly line care. For Rebel News, I'm Tamara Ugolini, and the advocate that I'm bringing you today can attest to the atrocities faced by seniors in long-term care that long predates the COVID-19 pandemic. The decades-old issues surrounding long-term care in Canada have simply been exasperated by the pandemic. I've touched on many of these issues in my previous reports, which you can find at rebelnews.com. In Ontario, we had a commissioner's report that highlighted the lack of communication between government, their agencies, the long-term care homes, and the families that individual seniors rely on to fill the care gaps that overworked staff just can't tend to. We had a military report that found horrific infringements on senior care, from the deplorable infection control to the neglectful care, all compounded by inadequate staffing levels and training. Kathy Pearsall is no stranger to this system. She witnessed just how suboptimal the care was that her father received when he was in a care home, and she has been a seniors advocate ever since, continuing this work for 20 years after her own father passed away. As an independent journalist herself, Kathy is also affiliated with the Canada-wide advocacy group called Hands of Hope. They have come up with proposed national regulations that they want to see legislated in order to begin to repair the issues occurring in long-term care. Kathy wrote a book called Broken, which outlines the problems in long-term care in a clear, impartial, easy-to-read, and concise manner. From someone who had skin in the game, who refuses to leave the system unhinged and broken, here is what Kathy had to say. And on the back of your book, it, the description reads, broken promises, broken rules, broken care, broken bones and broken families and broken hearts. How has the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent public health policies that have been put in place affected this already fractured system? Well, the pandemic certainly opened everyone's eyes to the dysfunction uh, at the facility level and also at the government level. Um, it exposed chronic short staffing, uh, caregiver burnout, incompetent management, lack of teamwork, medication errors, uh, all the things that have been going wrong for decades. We finally saw them um, because of the pandemic. Uh, so the policies, unfortunately, were rooted in, in panic and fear at both the facility level and at the uh, government level. And so a lot of mistakes were made. Um, so, for example, I have a friend living in a long-term care home in Toronto, and I kept in touch with her every day. And, and she said the staff there were so terrified to be near anyone who tested positive for the virus that these people were left alone in bed to die from uh, dehydration that that was common practice. And so while that was going on, the family members were not allowed in. So there's another, another uh, public uh, policy disaster. Uh, they, should, they were quite capable of putting on masks and gowns 
uh, to go in and, and lend a hand, and they were not allowed in. And so the lessons learned from this, uh, this uh, fiasco uh, were that um, long-term care homes do not have pandemic plans uh, as hospitals do, and they need them. And families should never be locked out under any circumstances. Right. And I mean, there's so much to cover in this, the long-term care sector. I, I imagine that we could spend hours talking about it. Uh, but one of the key issues, and then I think it, it ends up spilling over into all of the issues faced in long-term care, is this assembly line fashion in which these poor seniors are treated. Uh, we know that efficiency increases revenue. Um, and how has that, what you describe in your book as this mushrooming of overpaid bureaucracy affected the care that seniors receive? Well, I, I think the simple answer is that the system values bureaucrats uh, more than it values caregivers. Um, and so, you know, long-term care workers are the most exploited uh, people you'll ever meet. Uh, and so the, the caregivers and the residents would, would benefit enormously if we could downsize the bureaucracy even just a little bit and direct some of that money into uh, the, the giving of care where it's needed most. Mm -hmm. and, and it said that, you know, the governments have, they, they obviously regulate long-term care, but in all the wrong places. Uh, your Canada-wide advocacy group called Hands of Hope, they have drafted a set of regulations uh, that you would like to see actually legislated at the federal level. And I've seen them, I've reviewed them. They seem very well thought out and reasonable. Can you give us a quick run through of uh, these regulations that you've proposed? Sure. Um, probably the most important one is the, uh, the need to uh, create a minimum staffing ratio uh, and minimum standards in long-term care. Um, we've been asking uh, for that for 20 years and we're not, uh, it's not been given. Um, we need to see mostly full-time and part-time, permanent part-time positions um, not agency staff positions. Those should be only used as a last resort. We want to see uh, in-house services such as me menu planning and food preparation. We don't want that outsourced. Uh, we want to raise the credentials and the experience of, of management. And then on the training, uh, on the training, we want uh, the uh, the direct care workers uh, receiving standardized education with certification. Everybody should get the same training. Their curriculum should in, include things like dementia care, uh, palliative care, uh, duty to report abuse, uh, English competency, and it would be nice if they could do a field placement as well. Uh, In-service meetings uh, should be done to, to build collaboration between these workers and big teams uh, should be created and that would include family, uh, family members being involved. We also want to eliminate all online training because it doesn't work. Uh, in terms of family involvement, um, families should be involved, uh, much more involved than they are now. They should be welcomed in to the teams mm -hmm. uh, and take part in advisory councils. Um, recreation staff, uh, we would like to see them renamed life enrichment staff because life enrichment is a is an all day activity. It's not scheduled in for an hour, uh, you know, every two days. Mm -hmm. uh, it in, it requires the delivery of of individualized care, especially to those who are bed bound, because they're they're really getting nothing right now. Um, and so the relationship building is important because you know everybody working together as a team can deliver much better care and um, we also don't want residents left in the rooms all day alone that's happening uh, the next one we're asking for is really really important it's whistleblower protection we want to see this legislated uh, so that families and staff who want to improve the system and and have complaints about how it's working will not uh, be fired or walked off the property and charged with trespassing, which is happening to families. Um, the inspections are really important. We want to see random uh, inspections done by an autonomous agency, um, so separate from government, so that um, 
these inspections, uh, we, would, we would actually get to, to see them disclosed and they would be done randomly and that would keep everybody you know, on their toes. Um, financial accountability is probably, in my mind anyway, the most important thing. Um, we want to see how these homes are spending their money. They claim to be underfunded. I've never seen any evidence of that. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Um, but we want to see the details. We want to know if they're tendering their supplier contracts. Um, we want to see their financial statements. The penalties, um, we want to see some. If, if a home is chronically negligent, we want to see them lose their license. Uh, and uh, finally, we'd like to see more uh, public ownership of long-term care. And uh, one way to get there would be to uh, phase out the for-profit care simply by capping their, their profits. I think this would drive out the big corporations and bring in uh, you know, some competition, which would be fine. Uh, we wanna see management salaries uh, uh, capped, I, I guess, at rates of inflation. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to see uh, an even playing field when the uh, for-profits and the non-profits compete for licenses. So that's everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, that seems seems like very well thought out, reasonable, rational suggestions to make. Um, and on that note, I understand that there are federal standards that exist for long-term care. How are those working out? Yes, there is a federal standard. It's been around for a few years, um, but it's nothing more than a guideline for the homes to follow and, and or not. And if they do follow the guideline, then they, they can become accredited and, you know, but it's, it's totally voluntary. So we need a lot more than a watery guideline to fix long-term care. We want legislated, enforced regulations. Um, Canadians have been asking for this for decades. Recently, the Canadian Medical Association did a survey saying that the majority of us want these legislated and regulated uh, and enforced. And so, yeah, so the federal uh, guideline as it stands is not, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Seems like a lot falling through those cracks. Now, mm -hmm. Kathy, just in closing, do you have a message for anyone, whether it be legislators, those who are profiteering from the long-term care sector, perhaps even just families experiencing these injustices directly? I think my main message would be that families need to be heard. Um, we, we can't uh, suffer through lip service anymore. We have to become more vocal. We have to hold our politicians' feet to the fire. Um, the, um, there is an election coming up and we're gonna be pushing hard to um, educate the politicians and, 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 and in every election going forward, we, we want long-term care to be a priority. Um, and that's really the best we can hope for right now. The whistleblower protection is something that, in my opinion, would serve all dissidents throughout the pandemic well, from nurses to doctors to psychologists, scientists, virologists, and teachers and counselors, all of those who have been advocating for a more balanced approach to the tunnel vision COVID-19 policies, but also for an open debate to test a lot of the decision making that's taking place. We need better whistleblower protection in Canada? And how inhumane is it to deny families, the same people that are sometimes the only ones able to provide comfort, respectful, and consistent care to their loved ones? We denied them access. It's disgusting. And still, nothing is being done to prevent this from happening again. For Rebel News, I'm Tamara Ugolini. It may not be whistleblower protection, but we have a petition that will be delivered to any and all governing bodies of doctors and nurses to stop medical silencing. The bullying and coercion of individuals using their freedom of expression has been unprecedented in wake of COVID-19 policy. And I think that ethics can only be upheld with continued scrutiny and debate. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach, and we need to bring back ethics in wake of harmful public health policies. 
If you agree that medical professionals should be able to question public policy when they witness it doing harms to their patients, please head over to stopmedicalsilencing.com and sign our petition. That's stopmedicalsilencing.com.